Hello and welcome back to a new video and please bear with me as I try to work with the lighting and it's really not the best setup I've got here and so I've been having some thoughts on what I could read next and then just today it just crossed my mind to read the Sabasa Wasutta, uh, the discourse on all of the asawas or the fermentations of the mind. And this is actually one of my favorite suttas. And so it's. Uh, so I think that other people as well might like this one. It's about guarding the mind and how to do it, how to guard the mind in different ways. So, that by, when, or I mean like, by guarding the mind, you guard and protect the mind from falling into evil and unwholesome states. So it's kind of like, uh, I think this is probably the best prelimin preliminary practice for any serious, serious, <laughs> A meditation practitioner or yogi or whatever name you might like to call a meditator who is not an ordained monk or nun and so this is an awesome sutta and uh, I think we should let it, let it speak for itself and so today I will be reading the Sabasawa Sutta discourse on all of the asawas and this translation is going to be from, we're going to try some a new translator this time tonight, because it's not really day. And the translator on this one, I think it seems like they've done a great job. It is from the Burma Pitika Association. And so, how to guard the mind. It's like... Um, when you, you're per pervading in the six directions and sending out metta, that can also guard your mind from falling into fear and anxiety and all those kinds of states. And this uh, type of guarding the mind is um, more so directed at uprooting and removing all of the taints and fermentations in the mind. So that the mind becomes pure, like gold, pure gold. And uh, I think that's a good anal analogy for um, what actually happens uh, if you use this technique, technique of guarding the mind. And so I think we should get into it. And I will start reading. So, thus have I heard, once the exalted one was staying at the Jetawana monastery of Anattapintika in Sawati. At that time, the, the Bhagawa, or the exalted one, the Bhagawa addressed the bhikkhus, saying, Bhikkhus, and they answered him, Venerable Sir, and then the Bhagawa uttered these words. Bhikkhus, I shall expound to you a discourse on the, res the restraint of all asawas. Listen well and pay good attention. I shall speak. And asawas means the defilements that befuddle the mind. They are like a liquor long, long fermented. And I'm reading the footnote here. They convey the idea of something flowing out that intoxicates or befuddles the mind. Asawa are usually classified into four categories. One, kamas, kama, kamasawa, or gross attachment. Two, and craving for the five sense objects. And two, bawa, bawasawa, uh, or craving for better existence, such as the rupa and arupa planes of existence. 
in the belief that they are permanent, stable and constant. This craving occurs together with the sasatta ditti, belief in eternalism. And number three, ajiwa sawa, uh, or the defilement of lack of comprehension of the four Arya truths. Four Arya truths, and Arya means noble. So the four noble truths uh, through maka insight. And for ditti sawa, or the defilement that is a false view. It says here belief, but view is better, I think. In this sutta, however, the last is not mentioned. It may be taken as part of the bawa sawa. Although the asawas are variously classified, they are basically only loba, greed, desire, and ditti, false view, and moha, ignorance or bewilderment, delusion, confusion, and so on. And going back to the text from this footnote, I think that was a good footnote. Not that my thought on it is so important. And here we go, continuing on. Very, very, very well, venerable sir, replied the bhikkhus to the Bhagawa. Who then delivered this discourse? Because I declare that there is the, extent, the extinction of the Asawas in one who knows and sees. And let's just take the footnote here as well. By one who knows and sees, it means one who knows and sees with right perception of phenomena. The use of this expression and on the basis of what is meant by knowing and seeing, the Buddha refers to the person who knows and sees. Uh, this sutta is a discourse taught with reference to the person and not the Dhamma. What is briefly said in this paragraph is that the one who knows and sees with right perception of phenomena is able to rid himself or herself of the Asawa while the Asawa proliferate for the one who does not know and see with right perception of phenomena they won't be able to and let me just find the text here again scrolling up so who knows and sees and not in one who does not know and see because what is known and what is seen by, by one in whom I declare that there is the extinction of the asawas, the right perception of phenomena. Now let's check this footnote as well. It might be interesting. So, the right perception of phenomena and the footnote. Right perception of phenomena, yoni somana sikara. Uh, proper attention, proper consideration, right perception of phenomena means perceiving all phenomena as impermanent, unpleasurable, and unsatisfying. Okay. Um, continuing on with the right perception of phenomena and the wrong perception of phenomena because in one who has wrong perception of phenomena there arise the asawas that have not, that have not yet arisen and there is also and there also is an increase of asawas that have already arisen because in one who has right perception of phenomena, there is no arising of asawas that have not yet arisen, and asawas that have already arisen are also removed. Because there are asawas that should be removed through vision. And a footnote on what is vision. Vision, uh, 
perception of Nibbana means of Suttapati Magga. So this vision is uh, the vision of the first stage of an enlightened being, one who has seen Nibbana. That's what it means by removing through vision. Asawas that should be removed through restraint, asawas that should be removed through proper use of requisites, and asawas that should be removed through forbearance, asawas that should be removed through avoidance, asawas that should be removed through rejection, and asawas that should be removed through cultivation of the factors of enlightenment. It's funny they don't put a footnote on what, is, what are the factors of enlightenment. But if you've seen some of my other videos, you might also remember some of it as the wings to awakening. Okay, continuing on. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast. Um, please make sure you can check out the text below so you can read along with me as well. And here we're moving on. I think this might be a two-part video just because I'm usually a little bit slow going through with these. Asawas that should be removed through vision. Bhikkhus. What are the asawas that should be removed through vision? Bhikkhus. In the world, the ignorant worldling who is not in the habit of seeing seeing the Aryas, who is not pro proficient in the Dhamma of the Aryas, and who is not trained and disciplined in the Dhamma of the Aryas, who is not in the habit of seeing the virtuous, who is not proficient in the Dhamma of the virtuous, and who is not trained in, and disciplined in the Dhamma of the virtuous, does not know these factors, which should be considered attentively, and the factors which should not be uh, considered attentively. Not discriminating the factors which should be considered attentively from the factors which should not be considered attentively. He considers attentively the factors that should not be considered, and he does not consider attentively the factors which should be considered. And we just went from 6 to 11 on footnotes. So, let's see what the footnotes has to say about this passage. So, the ignorant worldling means one who has not studied, who has not inquired into, and who has not connected the Pali scriptures concerning Kanta, Ayatana, hmm, origin, that's a Pali word for origin, and who has not achieved through practice the Dhammas that he should achieve. And number seven, who is not in the habit of seeing. What is meant here is seeing by means of the eye of wisdom and not by means of the physical or by means of the divine eye. Dipachakko. So this is different. This is the eye of wisdom. And it is not the divine eye and not the physical eyes. And so, moving on, this is the eye of the Dhamma. The Buddha, the Jacob, oh I'm sorry, number eight, the footnote on number eight was related to what? And the Aryas. Okay, so what are the Aryas? The Buddha, Pachika Buddhas, that's a private Buddha, a solitary Buddha, not the, the Gotama Buddha, which is our present Buddha, uh, Siddhartha Gotama, with, or I mean the Buddha. The Buddha, Pachika Buddhas, and the disciples of the Buddha who have attained one of the four Makkas are termed. Aryas. And so that means enlightened beings, basically. An enlightened being is an Arya, a noble one. And number nine, the footnote on number nine, who is not trained and disciplined 
one who has not yet been disciplined in the five kinds of restraint, who has not yet been taught, and who has not yet cultivated the five kinds of removal of the defilements, and who has not yet removed the defilements. That's what is meant by one who is not trained and disciplined, and by the virtuous, Sapuresa, is meant the Buddha, the Pachega Buddhas, and the Arya disciples of the Buddha. That is a virtuous one, a Sapuresa. Uh, and number 11, as factors, and Dhamma. Hmm. Okay, jumping back to the text. I think we I think those footnotes are does a good job of uh, relating some of the background which we not maybe not all of us know. And continuing on in the text, what are the factors which are considered attentively though they should not be considered? Because in one who considers attentively certain factors which should not be considered, there arises the defilement of sense pleasure that has not yet arisen, and there also is an increase of the defilement of sense pleasure that has already arisen. There arises the defilement of hankering after better ex existence that has not yet arisen. And there also is an increase of the defilements of hankering after better existence that has already arisen. There arises the defilement of ignorance that has not yet arisen. And there also is an increase to the defilement of ignorance that has already arisen. There are the factors which are considered attentively. These are the factors which are considered attentively by an ignorant worldling, though they should not be considered. And when in the footnotes we went from 12 to 14. So let's see what they say. Akamasawa, the defilement of sense pleasure, a gross attachment to and craving for the five sense objects. Bawasawa. The defilement of hankering and after a better existence, craving for rupa and arupa planes of existence, in the belief that they are permanent, stable and constant. This craving occurs together with sasatta, sasatta ditti, belief in eternalism, or view that eternalism is like real. And number 14, footnote, Ajiwasawa, the defilement of ignorance, the defilement uh, of ignorance of the four uh, Arya truths. So, being ignorant about the four noble truths, which is what the Buddha taught. Um, and what are those? Let's see. So, the Buddha taught that there is suffering and that the Buddha taught the cause of suffering and the Buddha taught the way that leads to the end of suffering and the Buddha taught the truth of the end of suffering. So yeah, that's one way to remember those. And uh, reading, continuing on. What are the factors which are not considered attentively, though they should be considered? Uh, because in one who considers attentively certain factors which should be considered, there does not arise the defilement of sense pleasure that has not yet arisen, and the defilement of sense pleasure also that has already arisen is removed. There does not arise the defilement of hankering after a better existence that has not yet arisen, 
and the defilement of hankering after a better existence also that has already arisen is removed. There does not arise the defilement of ignorance that has not yet arisen, and the defilement of ignorance also that has already arisen is removed. These are the factors which are not considered attentively by an ignorant worldling, though they should be considered. And no footnotes. Because such a person considers attentively the factors which should not be considered. Mm, oh, okay, I read it right. Because such a person considers attentively the factors which should not be considered and does not consider attentively the factors which should be considered, there arise in him the asawas that have not yet arisen, and there, are, and there increases in him asawas that have already arisen. That person considers improbably the, thus, improbably thus, did I exist in the past? Did I not exist in the past? Who was I in the past? Who was I in the past? So that's the same thing twice. Is this a mistake? Who was I in the past? Who was I in the past? In the past? <laughs> Okay, so let's just see them first. Okay, so. Who had been I and who was I in the subsequent existence? Will I exist in the future? Will I not exist in the future? Who will I be in the future? Who will I be in the future? In the future, having been who, who will I be? Also, as regards to the present, uncertainty arises in him thus. Do I exist? Do I not exist? Who am I? How am I? From where has this I come? Where will this I go? In a person who considers improbably, uh, there arises one of the six wrong views. The view, I have a self, arises in him, really and firmly. And let's see what footnote number 16 says. Atta, the view of self or the view of Atta, which means self in Pali. In this context, I mean self. Okay. Or the view, I have no self arises in him really and firmly, or the view I perceive self through self arises in him really and firmly, or the view I perceive non-self through self. And non-self, the Pali word for non-self is anatta. This is also the wrong view saying I perceive non-self through this myself. So that's also wrong. Wait with that. Uh, arises in him really and firmly. Or the view I perceive self through non-self. So there is a me through non-me. I mean, you can think this up yourself. Uh, arises in him really and firmly. Or he has the view thus that self of mine speaks knows and experiences the results of wholesome and unwholesome actions. So this is the wrong view of an experiencer. Let's see what the footnote says about that, number 18. In 
in terms of birth, destination or planes of beings. Okay, yeah. And then? Uh, that self of mine is permanent, stable, durable, incorruptible and will be eternal like all things permanent. This is also the false view. Because this wrong view is called false, false belief. A jungle of false beliefs. A desert of false beliefs. A thorny spike of false beliefs. An agitation of false beliefs and a fetter of false beliefs. Because the ignorant whirling who is bound up with the, with the fetter of false belief cannot escape rebirth, aging, death and grief. Lamentation, pain, distress and despair. I declare that he cannot escape dukkha, which means suffering. And let's see what the footnote says. 19. Both these paragraphs, 18 and 19, teach at length the attending of those dhammas which are not worthy of attention and the arising of the 16 kinds of uncertainty, which is kicca, and of the six kinds of attaditi, view of self. But I don't think that the... Okay, so it's talking about the paragraphs and not the word dukkha. And this is, will be paragraph number 20. Uh, because the instructed Arya disciple who sees the Aryas, who is skilled in their dhammas and who is trained and disciplined in their dhammas, who sees virtuous, who is skilled in their dhammas and who is trained and disciplined in their dhammas, who knows the factors which should be considered attentively and the factors which should not be considered attentively discriminating the factors which should be considered attentively from the factors which should not be considered attentively. He does not consider attentively the factors which should not be considered and considers attentively the factors which should be considered. And because, what are the factors which are not considered attentively as they should be? not be considered because and because that means monks I'm oh, sorry I forget to say uh, because means monks and one who considers attentively certain factors which should not be considered there arises the defilement of sense pleasure that has not yet arisen and there also is an increase of the defilement of sense pleasure that has already arisen there arises the defilement of hankering after better existence that has not yet arisen. arisen. There also is an increase of the defilements of hankering after better existence that has already arisen. There arises the defilement of ignorance that has not yet arisen. And there is also an increase of the defilements that has already arisen. These factors... Oh, I'm sorry. These are the factors which are not considered attentively by the Arya disciple as they should not be considered. What are the factors which are I'm sorry. What are the factors which are considered attentively as they should be considered? Because in one who considers attentively certain factors which should be considered, there does not, there does not arise the defilement of sense pleasure that has not yet arisen. And the defilement of sense pleasure also that has already arisen is removed. There also does not arise the defilement of hankering after better existence that has not yet arisen. And the defilement of hankering at the bread existence that has already arisen is removed. There does not arise the defilement of ignorance that has not yet arisen. 
and the defilement of ignorance also that has already arisen is removed. These are the factor these are the factors which are considered attentively attentively by the Arya disciple as they should be considered. Because such a person does not consider attentively the factors which should not be considered and considers attentively the factors which should be considered, there do not arise in him the asavas that have not yet arisen and the asavas that have already arisen disappear. He considers probably, properly, he considers properly, this is Dukkha, this is the cause of Dukkha, this is the cessation of Dukkha, Dukkha means suffering, this is the practice leading to cessation of suffering, Dukkha. In him who thus considers probably, the following three fetters disappear, namely, the illusion of self, uncertainty and belief in the efficacy of mere rites and rituals. These are called asavas, which should, not, which should be removed through vision. And so, all of these asavas we just read about and, and learned and studied about, they are the ones that should be removed through vision. And the vision here is not meant the physical uh, vision, the, the vision of the eyes. And it is not the divine eye as well. It is through the eye of the Dhamma. And that means you have to become enlightened. Because one who has seen Nibbana just for one moment will know all of this. And if such a being should read this, they know everything that this text is talking about. And so, that's why even one who has opened their divine eye is still blind. Like, even God does not know how to go beyond Samsara, which is the cycle of birth, a sickness and aging and death. And so I'm just uh, waiting a little bit because we only have 30 seconds left on this video and I don't want to start this next, um, uh, what's that, uh, passage because that's kind of a new thing. We just ended the previous one which was called Asavas that should be removed through vision. And so now I'm just going to be talking for like five seconds and the video stops talking.